work autonomously and share knowledge. Problem solving again, communication skills, data science, machine learning, and a degree. So you see that you people are looking for people, someone who can solve their problems. And if you can sell them that you, you are able to do that, they will train you for all the technical requirements. For example, Python, database storage, I needed to know cloud and big data tools. This is something that I learned on the way. I did not know them before, and I certainly don't know everything right now, but people see that you are willing to work, you are hardworking, and then you'll be able to learn these because you have an amazing background. So, now that we have compared these skills and we know that we can move to a different uh, job if you want, what is the action plan here? First is know yourself very nicely and with details. With, this means that I want you to write down what are you really good at? What are the things that you can do occasion? Things that are troublesome to you? things that you will never do they are deal breakers and what will you do let's say if 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 someone offers you more incentive what kind of environment will you be comfortable working in are you an independent person do you like teamwork or big company small company are you a leader or do you just want to do your own work on a desk job does it does it have to be a gaming company for example anything what drives you every day what makes you wake up and go to work. And then what are you looking for in a job that the graduate studies didn't give you? And when you write these things down, you will clearly see what you are and what you're looking for. And one day when you miss astronomy down the path, you'll come back and you'll say, okay, this is why I started. The second step is do your research. First is read job descriptions. Now, when you're planning to move out and you're trying to swim into unknown waters, you need to know what is happening in the market, right? So first is you read job descriptions and you compare them to what you have and you will continue to see a pattern. And then you will know what you need to learn. Network, find your tribe. This means that network, when you network, you find people who are doing things that you want to do. And these people will support you. They'll be a mentor to you. They will help you find problems. They will help you find solutions. And how do you find that? My favorite platform was LinkedIn when I was looking for jobs. Uh, LinkedIn helped me connect with people who were doing the things that I wanted to do. And this was before COVID. So I was able to set up meetups with them, follow up and uh, set up interviews with them. Even after COVID, I was able to do that again for the next job, but it was all online. And people are really nice and people will help you if you show them that, you know, you are consistent with what you can do. So LinkedIn is a very powerful tool if you use it correctly. And of course, when these people tell you that, you know, these are the things that you need to learn, you go and find resources. So YouTube, for example, will teach you a lot of things you didn't know. And when I say learn the skills, I'm not saying you need to learn 100%. And I'm not saying you learn all of the skills that are listed in a job description. I have applied for jobs which satisfy only 40% of the criteria. And I've still gotten it because you don't, nobody, nobody's a unicorn and nobody can satisfy everything. So learn enough to talk about it. Other things are, once you have this community, you have to be active in it and you have to continuously uh, participate in the, in the events that are happening. So workshops, for example, local meetups and career fairs and employee sessions and webinars and societies, these all exist because so that you can go in and immerse yourself into, into the whole job market. But also, I don't want you to continue to just be doing your research and doing your work, but I want you to start. It doesn't matter how small you start, it's important that you start. So you could start with 
small internships, two weeks or three months or six months. Boot camps exist. You can also build your own projects. And if you don't know where to start, you can just start by re-implementing what others have done. And then you add your own spin to it. And that's what people will see that, okay, hey, this person is very interesting and they have actually done some work. They have tried it. There also exist student transition programs. So some companies will just pick you up from your university and they will just say, hey, we'll train you and come and work with us. There are other entry-level roles. And if you don't want to make a drastic jump, you can just find slightly different fields. For example, when I started, I was teaching and I was visiting planetariums and I was talking about astronomy and science centers and I was writing blogs. You can do that. Um, if you're doing more theoretical astronomy, maybe you can move to observational astronomy or you could just move to data science. I think that's the easiest way to slide into, slide out of astronomy. But all of these things, all of these steps that I have said, they are not linear. You cannot be, you cannot say that, okay, I write down all the personality traits, I do my research and then I get a job. Because success is never linear. You, you don't know how, what the path will be. So let me show you how my success looked like. So I'm, I probably started with networking and when I got a job, it was a small other job that I didn't mention then. I didn't like it and I realized that I was not as independent as I wanted to be. And then, well, I started thinking about the environment again. And then you meet more people, you talk more, you set more interviews, you realize you're doing something wrong. Maybe you need to do more practice. And then there's some sort of a back and forth there. Hey, you have to do more interviews, more talk, talk to more people. And on the side, maybe you're building a project of your own and then you get a feedback from someone you met at the workshop. They tell you, okay, look at this webinar, and this information in this course. And then you realize, oh, okay, there exists a whole another field that I didn't know. And then probably a motivation changes and now you want to work in a startup. So what I'm saying is that success evolves each day. It is not linear, it's completely messy. And success is a numbers game. The more you try, the more chances you get for success. And of course, success is subjective. If to your success measures are not the same as my success measures. So my top tips for transitioning from academia to industry will be show people that you really want it. People can see the, from the kind of work you do, how you present yourself, if you really want to do it. Second, emphasize the parallels. The way we have drawn parallels from the skills to the job description, the way we have compared, do that more and do that for people. The one thing I learned was that people outside astronomy don't know what astronomers do. When I tell someone that, hey, I'm an astronomer, they think I'm looking through a telescope all the time. They have no idea what we do, how we code, how we solve problems. They have no idea. So I had to literally lay it out for them. Hey, I do this thing. So emphasize, sell yourself. And then third, take time to practice your hard skills. When you're not selling, you need to be excelling in your skills. So practice, practice, practice. And fourth, keep interacting with the community. Today, each software has its own chat going on on Discord or in Slack, and they have their own support channels. You can, you can literally go deep dive into that community and learn that tool in one week or so. So use this community. Fifth is choose a company that fits your needs, not the other way around. Don't go after a company just because they have a good name. Because at the end of it, it's you who has to work, right? Also, lastly, um, after you have been through this transition or maybe going through this transition, there will be an aftermath. There will be a good side and a bad side. The bad side will be my 
फेमस लोग क्या कहेंगे और वॉट टू पीपल से दैट हैज बीन अ कॉन्स्टेंट इन माई लाइफ people will say you could not hack it did not suffer enough because of course you have to sacrifice in science uh maybe they if you worked harder you thinking maybe if you spend more hours or did not waste time eating outside then you would have succeeded you will also find yourself questioning your your own choices um, would i ever find something that would be as rewarding was that a wrong decision you would sometimes miss astronomy uh especially because uh, especially when you like fundamental research and miss having those conversations with students and advocate for science uh that might happen sometimes you would not get enough time to work on problems like if for example you like to deep dive on problems and work on it for till the end sometimes that might not happen in corporate world because uh, deadlines and sometimes there's just another crisis ah oh, but the good thing in my experience leaving academia opened a world of opportunities for me and it was a completely different intellectual challenge and it made me more engaged and energized so i was in low stress environments outside academia and much better financial and psychological stability for us there is no suffering no glorification and very much more money um better work life balance this is something that i really like that i'm able to do other things also and that feeds into my curious mind right this is one thing that is common in scientists and in research that we have a curious mind and we cannot continue doing something routine so and the the time from the work you have done to the results that decrease so all the tedious paper writing and proposal writing was not there and of course you are tackling challenges on a day to day basis and if you're creating your own tools i am creating my own tools every day and of course you get to make an immediate impact on the business that you are in involved uh, working in and the best part is that there this decision is not binding you are able to move around you are able to go back if you want you are able to explore your own ideas so if you had to take one thing today i would say take take this decision very seriously and try to be flexible about your future thank you so much please feel free to reach out to me if i can be of any help to you and these are the best two two best ways my email and my linkedin i'm always here thank you uh thank you very much dee that was a very nice talk to start with i mean although it was uh, directed towards people who who want to who are probably looking for opportunities outside academia for astro in the astronomy field but then it was also it also made uh, us capable of uh, our like the 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 skill set that we possess or the opportunities that we can have so it was it was very it was very nice talk and it was very uh, good talk to start this symposium with oh, thank uh, you now uh, okay so i see um, a hand raised by bagla sir So, yes. sir, maybe you can unmute and uh, ask the question. Hi, yeah. sir. <laughs> good morning, uh, Prashansa, or good night wherever you are, depending good on where night. you are. Good night. All right. Good to see you. And uh, thanks for uh, highlighting the options which exist. And I think students should be aware of it. Uh, yeah. I expect that in coming years, uh, roughly half of the students who do want to stay on in research. will go outside of academia and do this kind of work uh, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully with the startup culture starting taking off in yes. india there will be opportunities within india as well we mm -hmm. do have actually half a dozen students who did projects in astronomy and who are not working in academia but mm -hmm. unfortunately only you responded positively and uh, agreed to give a talk so thank you for that uh, 
you did go through a process before moving out of academia. You did go through a process of uh, working with in various collaborations and also applying to a group working over there so in and uh, with with that experience is there something which you want to tell uh, students as to what is it that they should prioritize when they are trying to figure out what group to work in yeah yeah um, i've had uh, my set of adventures <laughs> um, i guess the best advice i can say is when you're choosing your phd uh, wherever you want to go for a PhD. Yeah, in general, people choose what is a project. And I only focused on project. Uh, the project was amazing. And I, it had a lot of potential. But you should also try to understand who you're going to work with. For a PhD, it goes on to five years, six years, seven years. It's a large chunk of your life. And it's a huge decision. So try to understand what the advisor is like. Try to understand what his working style is, um, what he expects of you, what is the success criteria for him, how are you a good or a bad PhD student, him or her. Uh, how, and also try to ask other students who have been in, who have worked with that person in the past. Because that will give you a whole picture and that will save you a lot of heartbreak later. Um, me and I know a few other cases has, have happened that, you know, it, didn't, it doesn't work out that nicely. If the project is alone is not enough. So try to figure out if you, if you are able to understand how the advisor, advisor is and if you can match that frequency. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we will ask if the offline audience has any questions. And if you people have any questions, you can just uh, come in front of this laptop and ask your questions so that even online audience can see. Hi, I'm here. I'm MS20 batch. No. Uh, I'm from the MS20 batch. So uh, I had a couple of questions. So. Uh, I guess the first question would be, was this transition which you made from uh, academia to industry, was this sort of always the plan or something which just happened along the way? And if it did happen along the way, when did this thought process sort of start with? Yeah, it was never the plan. Um, as I said, like I was doing astronomy since my school, so it was never the plan. Um, it happened along the way, especially after I went to Montreal, um, partially because as I said, the advisor portion, it is difficult to understand how the working style of the advisor. And so, and coupled with that, I also was, I felt like I had done a lot of astronomy and I wanted to do something more. Um, and I felt that I was missing at that point. So that's why I cut short the PhD at that point. So it just felt right at that point. Yeah. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have a question about this? Okay. So uh, I had a question or sort of uh, request. Would you like to, I mean, explain what your current job consists of or what you exactly do in this job? Some people might also be interested in this field. Yeah. Um, currently, I'm in a cybersecurity company. So this company is basically, we have clients, clients which are different companies. And for each company, we uh, monitor their systems for them. And we monitor for attacks from outside. Um, we have a whole team who sits 24-7, um, 365, monitoring these attacks. And these, these are different attacks. Like these could be viruses or these could be just like normal, uh, any kind of uh, attacks that are happening. Um, what I do is I'm a DevOps engineer. DevOps means development and operations. It's a new, kind of a new uh, job uh, in the market in around a few years. Um, my job responsibility is to increase the efficiency of the company. Um, reduce manual work by writing code. Um, I work in cloud platforms where I'm making pipelines, for example. 
and those pipelines streamline company processes. So people don't have to do manual repetitive work. Also adds efficiency. I'm adding machine learning stages to the pipeline so that you, the computer makes predictions for you and you don't have to worry about that too much. Um, since it's a cybersecurity company, I am also adding security at each step, at each layer of the software. Um, and of course, we get projects from clients. Clients have needs like currently I'm working on um, a pipeline that will send data to the client as and when they require. So there are different requirements for that, like how will it be sent? So it's a detailed uh, project there. I'm happy to talk more if people want to know. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, we'll go to the uh, online audience. If they have any questions, they can uh, raise their hands or they can just unmute themselves and ask or ask in the chat. Uh, is my is like this uh, audio from my, my side clear? Yeah. OK, OK, good. So does anyone from online audience have any question? I just wanted to add a comment that uh, uh, three of my former PhD students are now uh, working in industry. Okay. Oh. okay, That is three out of eight. Uh, this includes the first two. First one made the transition very soon after finishing PhD. And uh, he has also been steady in the sense that he joined a technical position in an oil exploration company. And he has stayed with them. I mean, now, now it's uh, around 16 years and he stayed with them. He enjoys his job, although he's moved around a bit uh, to different locations, but he stayed with them. That's uh, uh, Suradi Prey. Second okay. was uh, Jayanti Prasad, who stuck on in academia for a long time in soft positions and yeah. uh, finally took the plunge about five years ago. Uh, this was after he had shared the breakthrough prize for uh, gravitational wave discovery, <laughs> got his uh, share, $1,000 and so on. Uh, he is primarily into teaching uh, uh, high performance computing, data sciences and so on, and also doing some development on the side. The third is uh, Sandeep Rana. He, uh, after his first postdoc, he shifted to industry so now he is kind of trying to look for a halfway position, which is uh, technical support, but in an astronomy research institute. So, so there are opportunities and uh, one should uh, always have an open mind. Always assess as to, as Prashant uh, mentioned, that what is it that makes you happy and uh, settle accordingly. No, don't look down on such positions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, if we don't have any questions from online audience, then we can probably conclude the session. Okay, thank you so much. And thank yeah, you please, feel, please feel free to contact if you really need anything. Okay. Yeah, thank you very Bye. much for joining us, Dee. Okay. Uh, Could you unshare your screen? Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for the next session, uh, I will uh, ask Aditi from MS20 to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ashutosh Tripathi. Yeah. Uh, so hello everyone, this is Aditi from MS20. And the talk two of the day is testing general relativity using X-ray observations of black holes, uh, presented by the speaker, Dr. Ashutosh Tripathi, MS09. Dr. Ashutosh graduated from Isa Mohali in 2014. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Center for Field Theory and Particle Physics and Department of Physics at Firan University, Shanghai. He is currently studying X-ray astronomy of black holes. In today's talk, Dr. Ashutosh will explain the two methods which are used to analyze the X-ray emissions from a black hole, and he will present the test of his theory using X-ray observations of a supermassive black hole, MCG06, 
3015 and NX3 binary CX3394. It is our pleasure to have you with us today, Dr. Rashidosh. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you.
using the electromagnetic radiations that we found around the black holes the emissions that we have from the accretion disk uh, which i will explain later so here like uh, are my collaborators with which i work so the uh, the saurav javier and thomas they are involved in the modeling part of the of the black hole uh, like the emission and the jack steiner victoria and lejon they are the people who assist me in data analysis so i will start with my yeah so till now from 2019 i am a postdoc researcher at fudan university and there i got a international postdoc exchange program grant which is a very prestigious given uh, grant given by the government of china and before that i did my phd in theoretical astrophysics uh, at the same university under italian astrophysicist professor cosimo bambi so most of my work uh, rely on uh, depend on this uh, del silenke model which we develop for testing gravity near black holes about which i will talk more about in my talk and i am right now in transition so in april i will join the southern methodist university in us for my next post talk so here what i will talk in my what i will talk about so i will first define black hole from two different perspective which is like the theory theoretical and the astrophysical perspective and then i will explain that why such test of gravity that we are doing is important and then i will explain the two methods which is currently used like most mostly used to uh, examine the emissions from the black holes and then uh, i will explain the model which is actually been uh, developed to uh, explain that uh, like the data coming from these black holes regarding these methods and then i will show my results for this agn mcg63015 and these two x ray binaries lmcx1 and gx394 and then i will summarize and talk about my future work so first i will talk about black holes so the black holes astrophysically they are as we all know that they are the objects so dense that even light couldn't you know, escape from it and as so we cannot we do not have like any method like we like from the electromagnetic radiation point of view to you know see what inside the black hole or around it so in order to uh, examine the properties of the black hole or you know what the properties of the black holes we actually study the emission which comes uh, around it so in the picture so here there are like two types so first i will talk about the stellar mass black holes so these are actually the uh, you know the x ray binaries uh, also known as x ray binaries these are the first one discovered in 1970 which is cygnus x1 so they are basically the systems the black hole Uh, which is made up which are like very light you can say they are like 3 to 100 solar masses and they are mostly present in our galaxy like the the black hole that we can see or that we have observed till now mostly they are in our galaxy and so this is the picture that we have here so this is the black hole the stellar mass black hole and this is a companion star from which it is taking like the material so due to the angular momentum conservation it forms a disk around it which is known as accretion disk and then due to these 
so this is a jet which is observed in radio and uh, so the disk temperature so the temperature have a certain like the disk has a certain temperature which is lie in the soft axis which is around uh, 1 kv so and then the spectral states so basically the emissions of uh, the black hole is basically varies uh, like it, it actually varies like time to time so it is actually characterized by the hardness intensity diagram so it's so like sometime it has a soft state and sometime it like hardens the when the so it depends on the emission which i will describe like later in detail so the next uh, type of the black hole is supermassive black hole so these are like the massive ones uh, they have the mass of around like million to uh, billion solar masses and they are actually resides mostly in the center of the galaxies so basically due to their heavy mass and you know they are very very small so they have uh, you know the very high gravitational pull so then they have these uh, dust around it which is eventually uh, you know condensed to form the stars and then uh, so they actually reside uh, found mo uh, mostly in the center of the galaxies and they have uh, the outflows uh, which are actually the torus of the neutral gas and uh, gas and dust around it and they also form accretion disk because of the angular momentum conservation from the you know gravitational pull of the black hole and then the dust condensing around it and so there are certain supermassive black holes in which like the center of them is like very shiny so it actually outshine the with the whole galaxy so these particular class is known as active galactic nuclei and so at, uh, so most of my work i did on agn which i will explain in my talk so now i will explain the black holes from the gr point of view so as we all know that in 1915 albert einstein he proposed the general theory of relativity which actually explain uh, many tests which happened later so in 1919 eddington perform like the he, he actually uh, explained the successfully the deflection of light by the sun uh, so you know so and after that from 1960 to till now uh, this theory has successfully passed so many tests uh, in weak field limit so so by weak field i mean that the so the gravity is not very strong here uh, as compared to the black holes which we encounter later so now like with the advancement of the te uh, technology we can actually design experiments to test the strong field limit which are eventually the black holes so the black holes uh, they are the 4d solution of the einstein equation uh, so uh, they are they are like some no the air theorems which define uh, define uh, which actually says that uh, the a black hole can be characterized by this mass angular momentum and the charge and so the uncharged spinning black hole like the so uh, the uncharged spinning black hole means that it only has two uh, quantities which is mass and spin so these kind of black holes they are referred as uh, like the third solution given by the gr and it actually describes the space time around the astrophysical black hole like the most of them and in this aspect the accretion disk nearby stars and electric charge they are considered to be negligible so here i motivated why do we need to test the gravity near black holes so uh, people like they investigate that there are some cosmological observations uh, which and they also try that uh, the dark energy can be the result of this so they also speculate that you know the gr can break down at large scales and there can also exist like some other fields other than the like something that is described by the gr with particular properties and there are also like the increasing interest you know, among the uh, astronomers to see to detect the deviations from the prediction of the gr so in weak weak field limit we can see that you know there are uh, the gr successfully passed like all the tests but people want to see that if we test uh this theory in the strong field limit is it also like uh, able to success like successfully pass that so in order to uh, test it they want to test it in strong field gravity 
and also this is like a direct observation confirmation so if we get a for example that if we uh, you know observe a black hole which doesn't follow you know the third hypothesis which is predicted by the gr then we have a direct observational confirmation so that's why you know people want to uh, test gravity and then theoretically there are expectations that you know the gr has some deviations so they are they can be the classical extension or there are some quantum gravity effects and so in astronomy like most of the models that exist today they assume that gr is correct and then they you know make their models assuming that the photons that are traveling around the black hole they they essentially travel in like the space time metric is kermit so we need to test it so that's why these kind of tests are important because we don't know exactly that you know the black hole is per uh, per black hole or not it means that we don't know that whether it follows the gr or not so we need to test it so here uh, there are like two approach that uh, you know we usually people follow the one is like top down approach in which we test a specific theory against the einstein theory but the issue is that there are like large number of theories but we do not know the exact rotating black hole solutions of those theories so in principle sorry we cannot use uh, these theories like right now and then there is bottom up approach in which that there is a so for instance they actually introduce some deviations in the kerr geometry like the kerr metric and they quantify those de deviations by the number of deformation parameters and then they try to constrain these parameters uh, using uh, observations and if and then they say that okay there are some uh, deviations from you know the kerr metric so we actually follow the bottom up approach uh, so essentially this is the uh, line element uh, of the johansen metric which we use in our work so essentially this is uh, the generalization of uh, kerr metric which is given by the gr theory so uh, and then these are the deformation parameters alpha 13 alpha 22 epsilon 3 and alpha 52 so if these uh, these deformation parameters vanishes then this big term over here it reduces to the uh, the, the kerr hypothesis kerr, kerr metric so and then uh, we try to constrain these deformation parameter using observations so the method that we will use first of all is x ray reflection spectroscopy so this is the schematic diagram of the black hole so in the center the black one is the black hole and this is the accretion disk the edge on uh, view so uh, the disk has certain temperature so due to the temperature it emits the thermal radiation so the part of thermal radiation it comes to us like we view it from like from our telescopes x ray telescopes in the space and the part of this thermal component it goes to this uh, star looking cloud uh, which is known as corona so this is corona the geometry is still debated but like we can see that this is a cloud of uh, you know electrons above the black hole so the part of thermal component it goes to the corona and then here it the radiation the photons it uh, you know interacts with the electrons there and then they generate the power law component and then this power law component uh, you know the some part we observe it directly and a part of it goes back to the disk and then here in the disk it interacts with the uh, you know with the with the material with the with the with the disk it illuminates the disk and then it gives the reflected component so this reflected component we get so from the from the black hole we get a thermal component a power law component and the reflected component for the x ray binaries like the small black hole stellar mass black hole these three components they lie in the x rays whether there uh, however in uh, for the cases of like agn uh, only like power law component and the reflected component they lies in x rays and thermal component it is like in uh, uv and uh, infrared uh, wave so as i am interested in like x ray observation so i i am not considering the thermal component of uh, agn in my in my analysis 
So this is uh, a simulated spectrum, reflection spectrum that we, uh, the emission that we get from a black hole. So here, this is uh, the reflection spectrum in the rest frame of the black hole. It means that there is no rotation, there is no uh, relativistic effects of, or gravitational effects of the black hole applied on this reflection spectrum. So here you can see that around 1 keV there are like a lot of uh, emissions and uh, you know there are this prominent F, F e k alpha line emission at 6.4 keV which is the most prominent emission uh, in X-rays and then above 10 keV we, uh, we have this Compton hump uh, which is uh, essentially the you know thermal scattering of the electrons in the emission disk. So this blue curve is actually uh, taken into account the relativistic effect. So, what if the this reflection, this emission, uh, reflected emission, it comes from the innermost region of the black hole? So here you can see these these sharp emissions around one keV. They just like goes away, and this is also like go, this is like like broadened. So you can see that all the emissions they are kind of like uh, broadened, and uh, you know they are skewed in some sense, you know, when we, uh, when we introduce the relativistic effects. And this is basically an absorbed spectrum means, uh, so in the case of AGN, I show you there is a neutral gas on torus around the, around the black hole. So this is, uh, that torus caused the absorption and this is the absorbed spectrum. So you can see there are like lots of absorption features. So emission is means like, uh, you know, uh, so this is like the photon flux. And so emission means that anything which we get more counts and absorption means something is absorbed. So the energy is just so, so these are the like, three kind of spectrum that we get from the black hole. So the reflection component, which we see in the rest of the gas, the red one, uh, it is actually modeled with a model, uh, with a model named silver. So silver is the radiative transfer model, which basically includes the uh, you know, atomic, uh, the K-shell atomic properties of ionized ions and how these uh, ionized, like the transfer of the ions occur. So it has a detailed treatment and basically this is calculated using the X-star. So X-star is a photo ionization code uh, used by the, uh, used in the, uh, in the such calculation. It is provided by the HESOF team. HESOF is a high energy astrophysics software provided by the NASA which we all use like in most of the calculations. So so basically silver gives you the reflection spectrum, like all the ionic, like atomic ion calculations and all this reflection, which you get at different energies. And then there is a different model, which uh, Helpon, which is give you the, all the relativistic effects. So for example, the Doppler effect, the, you know, the, the light bending and everything. So all the uh, effects introduced by the, uh, like, you know, if the reflection happens in the innermost region of the black hole, so it is affected by the black hole. So all these, all those effects, it contains in this uh, RELCON. So basically if we include like convolve these two, RELCON and silver, it basically gives you the reflection spectrum, which is emitted at the innermost region of the black hole like very close to the black hole at the gravitation radius of like 4 rg or 5 rg very close so if we get the measurement like if we get a emission from a very like near more like near the black hole then it actually uh, you know so it has the effects from the you know the gravitational effects so we can use those effects to calculate the properties of black hole so as I told you before that there are like two uh, main properties of the black hole, like mass and spin. So we can calculate the spin from this method directly. So that's actually we use. So we have tried to calculate the spin of the black hole. And from there we can get the, how the space time around the black hole is distorted. Like we, we don't assume like the GR solution, but we assume like the uh, different uh, metric. And then we see that, okay, how the how much the space around the black hole is distorted so this is the uh, relsil so the relsil is basically based on uh, recurve solution this is the model which is already present in the community 
which use like which assume that GR is correct and they make their model. But then we uh, modified it to RELSIL NK. NK means non third So it essentially says that no GR is not. So we assume that you know there there can be like different theories, different uh, space time metric which can define the photon trajectory around the black hole, and then we uh, calculate the spin measurements and everything. And so here I we consider this Johansson metric. So in this figure, basically we have the effect of the these deformation parameters on the iron line. So basically these are the iron lines, uh, the distorted ones, and we can see that in alpha one three case, uh, you know there is some distortion at the height, like in the in the flux. Uh, so these are the different values of deformation parameters, like minus one, one, two, and minus two. So we can see that in alpha one three and alpha two two case, there is like the distortion is the most as compared to epsilon three and alpha five two. So in my most of the work, I use uh, like I try to consider alpha one three and alpha two two. So these are the parameters which we use in this model. So index one, index two, RBR. This is basically define the emissivity profile of the accretion disk, which means that uh, as a, as a function of radius. So how the intensity of the emission varies along the radius of the disk, and then the spin uh, A is the spin of the object means the black hole. Inclination angle is the inclination of the accretion disk with respect to the normal. So how the so inclination angle is important because it actually affects that how it comes to you and you know uh, with all the photons. So when you know there is a rotating disk, then it will actually. It's, it is very crucial to understand that you know how. So basically, when the thing is revolving and the inclination angle is, you know, if, if you know the inclination angle, then uh, you also consider the light bending effect. So with all these, the inclination angle is important of the accretion disk. Then there is an inner radius of the disk, uh, uh, which is assumed, which we assume to be the, at the innermost stable circular orbit. It means that anything inside it, it goes straight, uh, straight into the black hole. We cannot uh, uh, like absorb, uh, observe it, and R out is the outer radius of the disk. Z is the redshift of the source, and then uh, the gamma is the power law index, uh, and, and then log size is the ionization parameter. So ionization parameter is is the measure of the like how the ions, for example, like hydrogen and helium, uh, how much they are ionized uh, in the accretion disk, and then there is uh, the iron abundance. Uh, which we consider in uh, the accretion disk. So there is a metallicity measurement basically, and then we also have the parameter which measures the reflection. So how much, uh, like the emission from the black hole, it reflected back to it, which is actually very important to, uh, you know, for the black hole spin measurements. And then uh, we have this depth part type one, two, three, which is essentially measure the deformation uh, from the From the per metric, so there is another method which is continuum fitting method. So this is basically the thermal like analysis of the thermal spectrum of the accretion disk. So the thermal component which I told you that it emits from the accretion disk, it actually analyzes that, and it based on the Novikov Thor model. And for that we need a thin disk. Thin disk means that the its identical like the luminosity should be between five to thirty percent. And then it has only like five parameters, not much. Which is the m is the mass of the black hole. M dot is the accretion rate. I is the inclination. D is the distance. And A is the spin of the black hole. Uh, in that, in this case, the m, i, and d that we use, it comes from the independent measurements that we have from optical or uh, you know infrared measurements that we have. And it has like simple shape. It has not much information. Uh, but in this case also, we use bottom-up approach. Uh, So here I will talk about some some of my results. So this is basically I will talk about the result of one uh, supermassive black hole, MG six thirty fifteen. So this is a narrow line Seifert one galaxy, which is a type of a uh, AGN. Uh, it has a redshift of zero point zero zero eight, very near to us, and it is actually a source in which the first prominent line in nineteen ninety five is observed. Uh, by Asta satellite, which is like very very primitive, it is I think one of the first uh, pioneer satellites, X-ray satellites, and it actually observes a very prominent iron line in this source. 
and the line is very very broad it means that it lowers down so iron k alpha line is around 6.4 and it lowers down to like 3 kv in this case so it was like very broad so people uh, think that you know comes from the innermost region of the equation disk so it is like the for the first time that you know people observe something from you know that close to the black hole so it is very exciting and then uh, we have like various observation of the source it's, it's a very famous source it is observed by numerous x ray satellites like after that uh, many times so it is confirmed that there is like uh, there are like two zone of like warm absorber warm absorber means that there are like the dust around the black hole which is ionized potential probe for us to study the you know how the you know we can test the gravity here because you know the line is very very broad so the effects of the gravity is more yeah so here actually i took data from like two satellites so there's a new star which is a very famous uh, which is a american mission uh, uh, you know it has the iron like it has an energy band of like 3 to 79 kv so essentially it covers the iron line and the compton hump and the x7 newton it only from like 0.1 to 10 uh, 10 kv so it essentially uh, covers iron line so uh, basically i need i combine the data from these two uh, satellites just to have we have the like the iron line and the compton hump both uh, in our data so that we have the full picture of the reflection spectrum so this is uh, like the light curve of these uh, of like these observations so here uh, basically this is a new star fpm b fpm and there are like two instruments and this is the xmm epic pn is one of the instrument of xmm so you can see that the flux like the count rate it goes from like 15 to let's say like 45 so it is like variable by the factor of 3 so this source is highly variable and uh, uh, you know so in order to analyze it i you know these these, these uh, horizontal line uh, signifies the different flux level that i take to so i actually divide my data into like these four flux states so that uh, i can analyze like i can you know pictureize these i can analyze like these uh, different spectral states like uh, you know differently uh, because they don't get mixed up because these uh, variabilities are because of the absorptions that we have around the around the source so we need to characterize it like very very carefully so this is actually the actual data looks like we like, see so, so the upper one is uh, the source counts that we have and the below one is the, like the background that we have so for the instance that when we take our observation so we have a source and then we have a background also so uh, we take so basically when you take an observation it is like source plus background and then you need to absorb, you know subtract the background from the whole intensity like the whole uh, data and then you get the source counts so basically this is the source count and this is the background one and you can see like in this case we have the thousand factor like you know, this is a thousand order of like 100 and thousand and this is around like one so the data quality is good which means that the background counts are less uh, in in this data set so because like it is also uh, very important that you know it should not dominate by the background because then it it doesn't make sense because you know you are taking us uh, you know observation of a source and if you get like more background then it will it will not be the like the like the photons that you are taking are not essentially from the source it is from the background so you need to be very careful so this is basically uh, to show the reflection features that i have in this data set so this is the iron line that i have around 6.4 and this is like the compton hump that i get so this is uh, like the actual data that we get uh from the excess satellites and so this is like the uh, like the so this is basically like how you define the source like you know you you have the reflection emission you have the power law emission and then you have the some other absorptions and then you have you know galactic absorption so this is basically this whole picture gives you the how you define the source in terms of this emission so this actually tells you that how i define the emission from this the x ray emission from this source 
so the tva we have it's a model which a mo which gives the galactic absorption so whenever you observe a black hole like a, a source then there is a you know like there is a galactic absorption also like there is a galactic dust which also uh, you know affect your uh, data so we need to account into that so this is something which take into account the galactic like the the ism absorption you can say interstellar uh, absorption and the dusty apps it is a neutral absorption by the dust around the source the neutral absorption and uh, the warm apps which is which take into account the like the ionized absorptions around the source and then this relsil nk it, it actually take into account the deflection component the deflection which comes from the innermost region of the black hole which is affected by the gravitational effects and then silver is like the distant deflector so you know there there can be like some reflection which is away from the black hole because in agn the the distances are more like they are like on the order of 400 gravitation radius so it is happened that you know there are some reflection taking place away from the black hole which is not that affected by the gravitational effects so we took like just the simple uh, silver and then the cut off pl it is just uh, model the power law continuum and these are the gaussian absorptions that we get so here is the alpha 13 and the spin constraints confidence uh, constraint that we get after analyzing like the data using this model you know we get a certain data in like 3 to 0.1 to like 80 kv and then we have this model then we you know use the likelihood analysis and then we make this confidence ellipses between the parameters so this is the like the first one is between the spin and alpha 13 the first deformation parameter so the red green and blue signifies the 1 sigma 2 sigma and 3 sigma limit like the confidence interval and so here we can say that they are like correlated and the the line uh, passing through zero it is a kerr solution is a solution given by the like the kerr metric so this actually agrees with the literature that you know people have done before so you can say that you know if we introduce some deformation in the kerr metric so it doesn't de uh, de uh, like you know de uh, it doesn't deny that you know it is uh, that it is not it is not like completely a black hole like kerr black hole so it is not like completely defined by the uh, you know the kerr metric Uh, but yeah like our analysis actually includes the kerr hypothesis so it also doesn't rule out the possibility that it is a kerr black hole so it is same for the alpha 22 and the epsilon 3 like all the three cases it actually doesn't rule out the, possi the possibility of uh, kerr black hole so this is uh, actually an example of using the continuum fitting method the, met the other method that i uh, discussed with you so lmc x1 it is the Uh, you know the first extra galactic extra binary discovered and these are the mass inclination and distance measurements which we took from like the other independent measurements uh, other than x rays so it has a stable luminosity which is 16% so as i told you that for a lens uh, for continuum fitting method we need uh, the disk such that the luminosity exists between 5% to 30% so we observe like 17 this rxt is a mission uh, from uh, from nasa Uh, which observe we took like 17 of the observation and then uh, we have this measurement of spin and alpha 13 so this is the same kind of contour that we build in this case but in this case you can see that uh, the, there is a lot of degeneracy uh, there is a degeneracy between the parameter uh, strong degeneracy because the you know we do not have any constraint uh, at all at you know three sigma limit so to counter that actually we uh, so this is something so we froze the parameters uh, m i and d so in this case we investigate that you know if we change these parameters like you know if the uh, so these measurements always have some error a uh, bar associated to it so we want to see that you know if these errors these observational uncertainties if we consider that and what would be the spin and the deformation measurements so here we we found that you know these measurements are like uh, consider like they are like stronger than we found in the our analysis so we can say that there like strong degeneracy exists between these two parameters which is uh, like because of the model degeneracy like 
we can it, it is not like something which depend on the observation so uh, we need to work on that so we are working on it so this is like the gx394 so, uh, source which basically uh, use both of the methods the x-ray reflection spectroscopy and the continuum fitting method so here also i use uh, the mcmc simulation for the combined alpha one measurement and this result of mine is actually featured in, a UK, in the UK magazine astronomy.com along with the research with the University of Oxford on reverberation lags, which is a different topic, like uh, which we did on uh, with them. So uh, here the constraints that we get from the MCMC simulation that we have uh, on these parameters. I'm not going to detail with that, but here uh, the takeaway message is that when we combine these two methods, then the constraints become stronger. So here we have uh, like after this we use we take like some new star data of like few X-ray binaries and then we studied it. So the new star data, so the new star satellite it is like you know most suitable for study such kind of reflection uh, because uh, you know uh, so there is a phenomenon called like pile up. So pileup means that you know if there is a photon hit on our detector, and if uh, there is another you know photon which uh, you know goes on the detector, so uh, you know sometimes what happens that uh, you know it heats. Uh, there is like more, uh, so it will read as one. For example, like you know if a photon hit on a certain place a detector, and then another photon comes and it hit at the same time, and then instead of uh, reading it as one for uh, two photons separate photon it gives it to read it as like one photon of like higher energy so it it is not affected like the new star is built up such that that it has no such issues and so it is suitable for like such sources the bright sources which has like more photon counts so uh, you know here also i use like engine simulations here are the sources that i use and here you can see like in these observations we have this uh, iron line and the compton home features like in all the you know the different uh, sources that i use so uh, you know this is like the summary of the uh, you know measurements that we have so far from this method so the green ones are the uh, x-ray binaries measurement using uh, x-ray reflection spectroscopy uh, till now and the red ones are from the gravitational waves measurements like which you know we have the gw measurements and then the pink one is uh, from the continuum fitting method and the blue ones are the combined ones so you can see that the combined ones are the most uh, regular the, the, the constraints are more stringent in this uh, in this case than you know as compared to other cases so uh, we try uh, to focus more on like you know combining these two methods and uh, you know try to get like more uh, tighter constraints on these parameters so other than this i also work on the alternate theory of gravity we use these different metric like the krz metric then there is einstein maxwell di uh, dilaton axion metric uh, then there's super spinning black holes means that uh, you know they if what if like the black holes have a spin more than 0 0.998 and then there are like the wormholes and the keplerian disk hypothesis so i also worked on and then i also uh, worked on you know uh, like the analyzing the quasi periodic oscillations uh, you know of these various agents in you know different wavelengths and try to see that why these oscillations occur in the light curves and then i also study like the systematic uncertainties in these various reflection models and as my you know as my next postdoc i will study the agent variability using you know these tests and kepler data sets so here i present the constraints on you know, alpha one three using both the methods, continuum fitting and reflection spectroscopy, for various X-ray binaries and AGNs, and I use data from like these uh, X-ray missions. Until now, the results we found they are like consistent with the hypothesis. So we can we do not find any black hole which denies the existence of uh, like in relativity. Uh, so we also need to address like the various systematics uh, present in the models. And then we also like to continue the testing gravity, like for other theories. Uh, and then we have to, you know, select more sources which are suitable for our studies.
for such studies of uh, like testing gravity. So what we need is like prominent iron line and they should have a low mass accretion rate and the spin should be higher. And of course the iron resolution, like the resolution of the telescope, uh, like uh, it should be higher, you know, at the iron line, like the interested uh, wavelength. So yeah, that's it. And uh, if you want to you know, discuss something on my work, uh, here's my email, just uh, give me an email on that. So I, I just have advice to the younger people here. So I just like want to tell you that you have to prepare all your basic courses thoroughly because they are going to be you know very handy in, in, in astronomy like in future. Like every course uh, you will study here, especially in ICER, they all will be very helpful for you. And grades are very important. Like please, you know, take care of it. Please study hard, get good grades get into good, you know, for uh, good school for PhD and then, you know, and the program is like well-tuned, like it's already well-tuned, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and the faculty is like really good. They help you, you know, every, like what, for whatever, like help you need. And I think there should be like more astronomy or data analysis oriented courses that, uh, you know, uh, like the undergraduate level in the first uh, two years um, I also believe that the research thesis that we did uh, like the last like the full one year, Recording in progress. Are there competing mechanisms? Like light bending effect. 